chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4. Uh, <clears throat> like I said, I baptized my sermon here. It's all soaked. But uh, uh, I want, you know, I'd rather baptize me with the Holy Spirit rather than get water all over my sermon. So David, I want you to lead us in prayer this morning, asking God's blessing upon the service and, and praying that God would fill me with thy spirit, with his spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, David. There's a difference between the body of Christ and the church. The visible church is in big trouble. The body of Christ is not. The body of Christ is those who make up the body because of their faith in Jesus Christ. God has the body in his hands. As I look out upon the modern day church, I see incredible problems. Churches by the hundreds, maybe by the thousands are closing down. Pastors, by the hundreds also, are walking away from the ministry. Never, never in my lifetime have I seen anything like that. What with the war in Ukraine and the pandemic still raging, inflation at an all-time high gasoline prices out of sight, and the worst government that the America has had in its entire history. It's no wonder people are discouraged. And what we need today is an encouraging word. I don't know anything more encouraging in the scriptures than this passage in Philippians chapter 4, particularly verses 4 through 7. Now, uh, I, I've got to share with you about verses 1, 2, and 3, because that sets the stage for the rest of the passage. 
You see, what has happened in that particular local church in Philippi, a couple of the dear ladies got, got out of sorts with each other. Now that never happens today. <laughs> yeah. But these ladies were causing great division in the church. You know what happens when a couple of the ladies get out of sorts with each other? Is people line up behind them. Yeah. Doesn't matter whether it's a scriptural problem or not. They just line up behind them. Because... because uh, uh, family blood is uh, always seems to be thicker than the blood of Jesus. And we have taken on this woe is me attitude. And, and I don't know anything more necessary today than a, than, than, than a word of encouragement. I've phoned my friend Tony Slutes the other day after he had gotten another fusion. And I, he said to me, he said, every once in a while I find myself singing. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's wonderful to praise the Lord. What a, you know, that's what we need to be doing. Uh, I was telling Aaron a few moments ago, years ago, I, once in a while I listen to Joel Osteen. <laughs> he's not my favorite preacher. Uh, he's not even a gospel preacher. But, but, but y you know what he does? Y you, you didn't know his father. His father was a hellfire brimstone preacher. I mean to tell you, he was a fire eater. Uh, he could he could part the scriptures and and cut you in half in in a minute, and he did, and and I think his son decided to just do the opposite, and just do nothing but encourage people, and 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 I've heard him on on several occasions, and I've never heard a negative thought come out of his mouth. There is a sense in which we do need some positive preaching. Amen? We need encouraging. And these ladies needed to be encouraged. These ladies needed to understand that, uh, that the church cannot stand division. And one of the things that's necessary is an encouraging word. And so we read in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, for the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto men, unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now underlying these four verses is, is five problems. Problems that we face in the world today. Five problems that they faced in Philippi. Five problems that Paul was addressing when he spoke these words from verse 4 through 7. The first problem is, is, this, is this doom and gloom attitude that, that the church has got. So what's the, what's the remedy for doom and gloom? Well, Paul says it's rejoicing in the Lord. It's amazing what praising can do. Amen? Yeah. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. In, in, in other words, rejoicing is to be a continuous action. Uh, it's not just once on Sunday um, or, or, or occasionally. It's all the time. Rejoice in the Lord always. That's the, 
That's the, that's the, that's the positive word. That's the encouraging word today. Rejoice in the Lord always. Get out from under the woe is me attitude. I was thinking uh, about some songs that I've heard over the years. Let me ask you, what song would you identify with uh, one or the other? Um, here's, Here's the first one. Make the world go away. And the other is, oh, what a beautiful morning. Which one would you identify with? How about these two? Raindrops keep falling on my head. (laughs) Yeah. Or, uh, I just keep trusting my Lord as I walk along. You you see, you see, uh, uh, whichever song you identify with will go a long ways in letting me know whether you're in the slew of despond or, or if you're on top of the world looking down on creation. Yeah. One or the other. You see, you see, rejoicing in the Lord is has a has a has a note of exaltation to it. It's something you're you're praising the Lord about, and 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 there's we there's lots of things we can praise the Lord about. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'm not telling you to rejoice in my preaching. I'm not telling you to rejoice in the government of our country. Or rejoice in the Pittsburgh Pirates starting to play baseball. <laughs> that's, that's the reason I'm decked out in black and gold today. I love baseball. But I'm not asking you to rejoice in those kind of things. I, I'm, I'm asking you what Paul was asking the church. Rejoice in the Lord. There's, there's enough to do that. The rest of your life. Amen. So, so again, uh, listen. If if this gloom and doom attitude is in your soul, wash it out with the word. Uh, Ephesians five twenty six. It tells us to do that very thing, washing, washing thing out uh, with with the word of God. The word of God is the greatest cleansing agent in the world aside from the blood of Jesus. So rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. There's another problem though. We see that problem in verse 5. That's a problem of being mean-spirited. It's a problem of Having a bad attitude. And so what, what's, the, what's the remedy? What's the antidote to having a bad attitude? What's the antidote uh, to, to uh, being mean-spirited? Notice that word moderation. Let your, let your moderation be made known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, words have a tendency to to change their meaning. Now, now today, today moderation uh, would 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 tell you that you can drink a little, you can smoke a little, you can lie a little, you can cheat a little, you can uh, do tell dirty stories a little. But as long as it's in moderation, it's all right. It's not all right. But that's how the word moderation is being used today. Back then, it meant something else. The Greek word moderation means sweet reasonableness. Catch that. Write it in your Bible. Sweet reasonableness. You see, that was the problem with Sintiki, or or, uh, I think that's her name. Uh, Sintiki and, and, and you odious. I, I call them odious and soon touchy. 
But that was the problem. That was the problem there. Uh, they, they had this mean-spiritedness about them. They had a bad attitude. And, and, and Paul, Paul said, hey, 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 let your sweet reasonableness be made known unto all men. Jesus is coming. You don't want to have this attitude of Jesus is coming. You know, we need to live in the light of the rapture. Can you say amen? We need to live in the light of the rapture because because the rapture is imminent. The rapture is any moment. I mean, I mean, Jesus could come before this service is over. You see, that's imminent. That's right now. And we need to live in the light of it. And we need a, a, a wonderful spirit of sweet reasonableness. And that's the, that's the encouraging word this morning. Be sweet. I was uh, coming out of our doctor's office up in Tipton. And I had to pass by. I, I had to go to another office to get some dates for the next time. And, and so I, I sat down and, and on the seat there in front of her and, and I, I, you know, we, we got some things worked out. And, and then as I was about to leave, I, I said, now, now be sure to stay sweet. And she said, oh my. <laughs> I thought, I thought, I thought, it must be pretty hard to stay sweet there. I don't know. Oh, my. Hey, listen, folk. Sweetness, sweetness will go a long way. See, what's the saying? You can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. Yeah? Stay sweet. Uh, get, get yourself out of the, 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 the funk of, of having a bad attitude. See, that's encouraging. And, and that's what he's saying here. He, he's telling us uh, to be sweet and to be reasonable. And if we do that, uh, things are going to go smoother. The division will divide. Just, just come together. See, that's what Paul's telling him. But, but the remedy, the, the remedy for, for mean spirit and spiritedness is, is sweet reasonableness, and that's the encouraging word for that moment. But notice, notice the next thing. What's What's, what's underlying this word, be careful? Well, the word careful here means to be anxious. It's to be filled with anxiety. It's to be, it's to be so nervous and so upset that, 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 that you're not fit to live with. And you're worrying about everything. Now we do. We worry, worry, worry. We fret, and we fret, and we fret. I, I, I find myself doing that. So, so what's, the, what's, what's the remedy for worry? Well, let's look at it. He said, be careful or be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by what? Prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known unto God. Did you pray this morning? Did you have your devotions this morning? We feel like our day is not ready to get started unless we have ours. When we get in the car... We always pray. My wife won't let me out of the garage until we've prayed. I mean, it doesn't matter whether we're going to the grocery store or to Indianapolis. We're going to pray and ask God to protect us as we, as, as, as we go. 
You see, you see, prayer is the antidote to worry. Now, worry, uh, you, you know what worry does? Worry uh, keeps you from sleep. I think maybe I was doing a lot of worrying last night. A worry, uh, worry makes, it, makes it so that, that you're not fit to live with. It upsets your appetite. Uh, it retards your, your, your performance at work. Uh, whatever, uh, listen, listen, worry, worry does every, by the way, worry never fixes anything. Prayer does. Sometimes maybe prayer doesn't either, but, but here's what prayer does. Prayer gets, gets the burden that you're worrying about off of your shoulders and gets it onto God's. Amen? Yeah, God's a whole lot better prepared to, to, to take your burden than you are. He's been around longer. So, so instead of worrying, Pray. If you want to, so what are you worrying about? You know, we worry about our kids. We worry about the grandchildren. We worry about paying the bills. We worry about whatever. We worry about our country. Don't worry about that. God's still in charge. So, so, Pray about everything. What did, what, did Paul, what did Paul say to the Thessalonians in chapter 5, verse 20? I think it's verse 18. It is chapter 5, verse 18. He said, in. That means in every circumstance, every condition of life, every possible situation, in everything by, uh, uh, by prayer. In everything, because, you know, all of life is filled with all kinds of heartaches and sorrows and so on. And, and, and we're supposed to pray involving all of that. So, so what's, the, what's the antidote for worry? Pray. Yeah. Pray about everything. Everything. Nothing is too small to pray about. You, you see, you you need to get you, you need to get the burden of your heart off of the front burner and put it on the back burner. That's what you need to do. Well, let's look at the next one. Paul. Paul kind of squeezes this in, David. I, you know, he says, he said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto men with thanksgiving. He kind of squeezed that in. But it's so powerful, so important. What's the antidote? To ingratitude. Ingratitude. You know, Americans are the most blessed people in the world. Amen. We really are. Yeah. I've been around a while, and I've been a lot of places. And I don't know any place that's more blessed to be than America. Oh, sure, we have our problems. But but I tell you, we, we're blessed above measure. And yet we're the most ungrateful. Amen. We complain and fuss about everything. From the food we eat to the bed we sleep in. From the house we live in to the car we drive. From the job we got to the pay we get for working. We bellyache and complain about everything. And what we need to do is just be thankful for what we got. That's what he's saying. With 
thanksgiving. So, so what, what he's saying in this verse, Aaron, what he's saying here is don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. And don't forget to thank him for the answers. So, so uh, what's the encouraging word there? The encouraging word is never, don't, don't, uh, don't despair. God is there. That's what the poet said. Uh, never, don't, dis, don't despair. God is there. God is in control. He's taking care of things. And to me, that's the most encouraging thing in the world. I don't have to do it. I don't have to worry about it. I oftentimes find myself doing it, but I don't have to do it because God wants me to put the, all the burden upon him and be thankful. And that's the encouraging word. Well, what's the next one? Look at, look at, look at verse 7. What's it say there? It says, And the peace of God that passeth all understanding. In other words, this, this peace is something that we can get that's unexplainable on the human level. Uh, you can't explain how that God is able to just give you special peace. Now we're talking about the peace of God, not the peace with God. You see, the peace with God is in Romans 5.1. And that comes through faith in Christ. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And so, so but we're not talking about uh, uh, peace with God because I'm, 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 I'm trusting that you already have that. What you need is the peace of God. God's kind of peace. But the problem is we're so filled with turmoil. I looked up that word turmoil in the dictionary and it means confusion. Let me see. Let me see. All, all that it mentioned. It, it says... Uh, turmoil is a state of great disturbance, a confusion, and uncertainty. Think about that. Confusion, disturbance, uncertainty. That's what, that's what has is captured the hearts of too many believers. And what we need is God's peace. Because... because uh, uh, when we have this woe is me attitude, uh, uh, it, it, just, it just ruins our day. I mean, from the moment we get up to the time we go to bed, uh, it, our, our, our hearts are in turmoil. Uh, our hearts are confused. Uh, our hearts are in turbulence. It's tumult. And that's the world that we're living in. And may I remind you that the world, the world, my, my, um, my, imagine this, the world uh, is at conflict with God. And therefore it's in conflict with us. But, but we can have God's peace. See, 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 the world can't have that. Uh, the, the world can't, you've got to have the peace with God before you get the peace of God. Amen. You can't get the, the one before the other. And, 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 and the good word, the good word, the encouraging word is that God wants to have, uh, he wants us to have his kind of peace. Let me tell you a story. I love stories. I used, to, I used to be able to tell stories that kids would just love. 
I, I mean, I, I, I've, I've, I've put most of my stories in a book that I've got that is no longer in print. But this story is about peace. It was, seems as though a king uh, sent out a request to all the artists of the world uh, to paint a picture of peace. And he would give a large prize of some kind. Well, uh, it, it, uh, it struck the imagination of many artists around the world, and, and they set their hands to, to coming up with a painting of peace. And he set a deadline as to when they were to be in. And so, and so the, soon they started coming in and coming in, and, and the deadline came, and, and people by the hundreds gathered in the palatial gallery of, of, of the mansion, uh, the palace of the king, and, and, and he began to unveil all of these wonderful paintings, and there were a lot of oohs and ahs and clapping and cheering and all that. But <clears throat> he put everything aside, all those aside, except for the last two. The, the first one that he unveiled was, a, was the most beautiful picture of peace you could ever imagine. There was a placid lake with a couple of birds, a couple of swan floating, not even making a ripple in the water. Uh, above the lake was the most beautiful, uh, almost, almost uh, uh, cultured uh, forest, mountains. A, a just a beautiful mountains, and above the mountains was the bluest sky uh, he had ever seen in his life. It was, it was so beautiful, and there was a couple of birds flying in the sky, and, and, and puffy clouds of white, and, and down in the pasture, off to the shore of the, the lake, was a flock of sheep grazing undisturbed. It was a beautiful picture of peace. And everybody thought this would win the prize. But he had one last one to unveil. And as he unveiled it, the people just gasp in amazement. How could this picture get into the scene? It was a picture of a rugged, raging river, uh, overflowing its banks. And uh, uh, the shoreline was filled with rocks, and, and, and the pasture land was nothing but, but briars and, and, and thistles and things of this nature. And, 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 and above the pasture was, was, was rugged mountains that that, that, that were barren at the top, and the sky was, was, was dark with clouds and rain coming down and flashes of lightning everywhere. And, and, and coming down the, 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 the mountain was this waterfall, and you could almost feel the coldness of the spray. And everybody thought, this is awful. How could this represent peace? But the king looked closer, and he saw that a bird had built its nest on a branch that extended out towards the waterfalls. And in the nest was a bird hatching her eggs in total peace. before me this morning, whose hearts are resting secure in the peace of God. That's the encouraging word this morning. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to come here this morning to share with your people about the blessings of the Lord 
rejoicing, praying, praying, 